Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ayelet Cohen. I'm the manager of programs and events at the Board, Burnaby Board of Trade. And welcome everybody for today's webinar. Before we start, I would like to take a moment to recognize that we are on the traditional homeland of the Hunkamanian and Skohomish speaking people. And we extend appreciation for the opportunity to hold a meeting on this territory. So before we start, I'd like to, to say thank you to our center sponsors. So this event is part of the programming offered by the Center of Burnaby Business Resilience. The center is your platform for programming and initiatives that support and foster resilience in our business community for the post pandemic world. The center is sponsored by a number of uh, organizations which help make it work possible. And that includes, there you go, um, 40, sorry, Simon Fraser University on the platinum level, Douglas College, BCAT School of Business and Media, and Electronic Arts on the gold level, Fortis BC, Hamlet Printers, Parkland Corporation, Mitchell Press, and TD Bank Group. Thank you for these sponsors. And as always, I'd like to thank our annual partners who are those organizations to stand out as top corporate citizens in Burnaby and support our work throughout the year. You can see their logos on the screen right now. Okay, and now for this event. So um, in this webinar, you will learn the basics of workplace culture, why culture and employee engagement is important how a positive culture can grow your business and what you can start doing today to build an amazing workplace culture. Um, and now we're pleased to get underway with today's session. Uh, we will hear today from Natasha Purnell. Natasha is the Chief Culture Officer at Park Insurance in Burnaby. She has 20 years of experience in management, leadership and entrepreneurship. Natasha is proud to boost about, sorry, boast her about Park's 92% employee satisfaction rate for internal employee surveys and a world-class score from an external Gallup survey as a direct result of her efforts. Natasha, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ailet. I appreciate it. I am going to do a quick screen share here and get my presentation started. All right, so I hope you can all see my screen there. Yeah, we can see it. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you to the Barnaby Board of Trade for having me present this webinar. And thank you to all of our lovely members for joining us today. I am delighted that you want to learn about my passion, workplace culture. We don't have tons of time today. So everything we're going to be covering is just at a surface level, 10,000 foot view. If you're interested in more details about how to develop an amazing workplace culture, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll put some uh, connection links in uh, the chat box at the end. And at the end of this webinar, I'll also be sharing some exciting information about a six-week culture bootcamp workshop that I'm launching this Friday. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, folks, so today on our agenda, we have what is workplace culture and what does an amazing workplace culture look like? Why are workplace cultures and employee engagement important to my business? What can small business owners and leaders like yourself do to create an amazing workplace culture? And lastly, we're gonna leave some time for question and answers. And throughout the webinar, I'm also gonna be asking you some questions and I really encourage you to throw up some answers into the chat box to keep that lively and interactive or also just do some self-reflection and write them down so you can reflect on them later. So what is workplace culture? And what does an amazing workplace culture look like? 
To me, culture is the way we do things around here. It is what is known as the personality of the company. Culture is something more you feel than something that you see or something tangible. Amazing workplace culture is prioritize people over policy. I get asked all the time what the difference is between a human resources manager and my role as chief culture officer. The way that I see it is traditional HR managers advocate on behalf of the employer to the employee. I am blessed enough to get to advocate on behalf of my employees to our employer. It is largely about how we can make this a better place to work. We all know we spend such a great amount of time at work on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. Why not make it a great, amazing place to work where you wake up every morning, you're passionate to come in. Amazing workplace cultures are employee-centric workplaces. They empower employees, foster psychological safety, and create engaged employees. Amazing workplace cultures have happy employees, and happy employees equals happy clients. I love this quote by Sir Richard Branson. He says, clients do not come first. Employees come first. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of the clients. And this is something that I have led by for the past 20 years. Richard Branson is a huge business tycoon, and I'm pretty sure he knows what he's talking about because he's been to space and I haven't. <laughs> There's lots of stats online about return on investments for workplace cultures and having engaged employees. I'm going to share some of those stats here with you today, uh, but even some simple research if you wanted to do more on your own will provide you lots of data about why it is important for you to concentrate on having an amazing workplace culture. Uh, happy employees have been linked to increased production and efficiency. And when I was doing uh, some research for this webinar and also for my culture boot camp, because I'm a lover of stats and quotes, I found this and I thought it was really interesting to, and I wanted to share it with you all. So it said that employers believe that 89% of employees leave because of more money. But when they, those 89 people were surveyed, only 12% of those employees indicated that they had left because of more money and 88% for other reasons. That 88% is where you have the opportunity to make employees happy. Having an amazing workplace culture requires a top-down approach. Top leaders and executives need to be committed to a positive employee-centric environment, to building an amazing workplace culture. Leaders need to lead by example. They need to live the values outwardly so employees see it and can mimic it. They need to be engaged, participate in socials, live the values of your company, be productive, prioritize well-being, ask for feedback, take vacations, clock out at five, essentially anything you're asking your employees to do, you need to also show them that you do that as well. I also strongly believe that it's important for leaders to cultivate people who are passionate about living your company values and empower those people to be culture ambassadors for your company. They're going to be hugely valuable assets to you and having that trickle down to the rest of the employees. And lastly, you need to take care of your people. They are the lifeline of your organization. Anyone who's had to do any recruiting or hiring in the past 12 months knows that it's incredibly difficult to find people, let alone great people. So you need to be passionate about taking care of your people, not only on a professional level, but also on a personal level so that they can show up and be the best versions of themselves. People's professional lives and personal lives are so intertwined. If someone is struggling in their personal life, they're going to have a really hard time showing up in their professional life, being the best version of themselves and vice versa. If someone's struggling in their professional life, they're going to have a really hard time when they get home, shutting that off and showing up to be the best version of themselves in their personal lives. So as leaders, I really want you to 
be conscious of that and start to think about how as a leader can you take care of both of those. So I don't think I can see the chat box, unfortunately, but at the end, we'll do a QA and a and we can circle back on some of this stuff. And I wanted the chat box to be somewhat interactive as well. So tell me in the chat box, what are some of your definitions of workplace culture? And maybe also, where do you struggle with workplace culture or creating an amazing workplace culture? All right, let's go to the next slide here. So you heard me mention employee engagement in the last side of it. So what is employee engagement and why does it matter? Employee engagement can be defined as the relationship between the employees and organ the organization. And so here's why this matters to you and some stats on it. Again, remember, I said I'm a lover of stats and quotes. 60% of employees are not engaged. They are just coming to work. They're doing the baseline. They're clocking in and out, not going above and beyond. That's it. This is the new phenomenon. If anyone's been on social media or LinkedIn lately, as I think, you know, it's been re being referred to as quiet quitting, which I know is a little bit more than that. But I strongly believe that this 60% of employees not being engaged is because for too long, we have allowed our people to work in cultures that treat them like machines instead of humans. And this is where you're getting this unengagement from. 15% of employees are disengaged. These are employees that are actively creating toxic, drama-filled work environments. They are a cancer to your organization, and you need to seriously consider removing these people immediately because they're damaging any efforts that you're doing to try to build an amazing workplace culture. 25% of employees are engaged. These are the employees that have buy-in to you. They believe in your purpose and your values and they live them. So only 25% of your employees are doing that. Can you imagine what your company would look like if you increased that number to 50%, 65%, 75%? And another interesting stat said 58% of employees say they want employee engagement surveys. I think that this number would increase more if more companies did regular employment engagement surveys and the companies and the employees um, could see the benefits to them and how much of a greater organization you can create from them. So here's some food for thought. And I, I promised you I would give you some tips about, you know, how what you could start doing today to implement this in your business. And so as we travel through this journey today, and as you walk away from our webinar today, I want you to ask yourself some questions here. Uh, do you feel like you have a positive workplace culture? Are your employees engaged? So ask yourself, are my employees engaged? Have you ever asked them if they're happy at work? And have you ever asked them what they want out of their employment? So how does employee engagement affect my bottom line? Higher employee engagement satisfaction has been proven to have some key business outcomes. So this is the return on investment. So you're investing time into building your people to be an employee-centered company, to have an amazing workplace culture, and this is what you're gonna get in return. So statistics have shown that by having engaged employees, you can have upwards of 14% higher productivity, upwards of 18% higher sales, upwards of 23% higher profitability. So you can see that. You can see that there's higher productivity, there's higher sales, there's profitability. People are like, I got buy-in. These people care about me on a professional and personal level. They take care of me. I, in turn, want to show up and take care of them. Upwards of 10% excuse me, improved customer metrics. Upwards of 10% increased customer loyalty. So keeping those employees, we uh, sorry, those uh, customers, we all know how much customer acquisition is. So once you have them, you clearly want to keep them for as long as possible. It also can result in a decrease of the, some areas that could increase your return on investment. So upwards of 28% less shrinkage or theft um, I'm sure anyone who's in the hospitality industry would really, this number would really resonate with them. 
less turnover, huge right now with all the recruiting issues, right? So less turnover, which means higher employee retention. So it says that there's up to 18% less for high turnover organizations and up to 43% less for low turnover organizations. Upwards of 41% less defects and mistakes. Up to 64% less safety incidents or accidents. And up to 41% less absenteeism or sick days. So these are just some of the key business outcomes. If you guys want to quickly grab your phones and take a quick screenshot of this, um, just to make sure that you have that information before we move on to the next slides. And again, a lot of this information I will be covering in my Culture Bootcamp workshop. It starts this Friday. It's two hours every Friday for six weeks. And we're going to be deep diving into all of the points on the next slides here. So this is what I believe to be the key elements to an amazing workplace culture. It is what I believe to be the ingredients to the secret sauce to creating an amazing workplace culture. So number one is employee engagement surveys. I personally feel this is the most important first step in kickstarting or refreshing your workplace culture. How do you know if your employees are happy, engaged, feel valued, have what they need to perform their best, and are passionate about working towards their your goals if you don't ask them? Do you know what your employees want from their employment? And if you think it's money is number one, you're wrong. I mean, think about that other statistics we saw that said that employers saw 89% of employees uh, quit because of more money, and really it was only 12%. It is extremely important to conduct regular surveys to find out where you're at and what changes you need to make to create employee engagement and satisfaction. You need to have a purpose or a reason to do the survey, so I encourage you to reflect on that and write it down. Some of the purpose examples, and they really should be based around your values of your company, but they could be to build a culture or build a more amazing culture, create higher employee engagement. Maybe it's around what teams need, need more training. Are key objectives being met? Is the tech helping or is it hindering staff? I mean, sometimes we think just throw as much automation at them as possible, but is it really helping them? Is it making their workload better? Is there enough flexibility? I don't know. Do they even want flexibility? We don't know because unless we ask. Is their overall health and wellness of staff good? What do staff want from working here? Employee engagement survey surveys should include questions based on your company values and purpose. And this will typically look different for each and every company because it could be custom made. There, I have a recommendation though, if you feel like you wanted something that's a little bit more out of the box. Um, for many years at Park Insurance, uh, we have a 92% satisfaction rate as Elit said at the beginning. Uh, for many years at Park Insurance, we conducted a 33 question survey every quarter to our staff. That's not what I would recommend you start with. Um, but every, I would recommend maybe once a year. Uh, now that we have a very high satisfaction rate and we've narrowed down uh, where we really need to hone in and work on, we have created an engagement survey library and we create every quarter a new survey based on 10 to 12 questions about what's happening in our business. Um, and then we also conduct an annual Gallup survey. And so write that down. Uh, Gallup is a um, 12 questions that are scientifically based on what creates high engagement from employees. And so some of the questions that you could either create yourself or you could do, grab from Gallup and, and do a custom build of your survey uh, could be, I know what is expected of me at work. There is someone at work who encourages my development. I have the materials and equipment to do my work right. It's also important to have KPIs. So you're going to want to make sure that you're tracking and benchmarking where you are and how you are doing as you move through continuing to do employment engagement surveys 
and analyzing the data and making changes within your company. Um, you can use uh, some of the business outcomes we discussed in the previous slide to help you guide you through your KPIs and tracking. And as they say, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Uh, but you have to promise me one thing. Uh, if you're going to conduct a regular employment engagement surveys, you can only do it if you're certain you can be humble about the results. You are dedicated to reacting to the feedback and making changes based on the results. Nothing is worse than asking employees what they want it need and it falling on deaf ears and blind eyes. If you ask for their feedback and do nothing, you're going to have a massive negative reaction from it and do more damage than, than good. Um, and again, this is all very, very surface level uh, and going to be covered a lot more in my boot camp. So ingredient number two is communication. Here's my number one rule for communication. If you think you are over communicating, you're probably communicating just enough. I'll say it again. If you think you are over communicating, you're probably communicating just enough. 74% of employees believe that they're missing out on important company news and information. And communication is everything. And we know this. We know this in all of our relationships, in our professional relationships, in our personal relationships, and that most breakdowns in relationships come from a lack of communication or miscommunication. So the better and more effective you can get at your communication skills, the more successful you're going to be in your professional and personal life. So as an organization and thinking about like, what do you communicate? Well, communicate everything uh, or as much as you possibly can, right? So you're going to want to think about communicating your values, purpose, plans, goals, KPIs, target, metrics, year to dates. I would say do as much as possible to be able to put yourself in your employee's shoes. Would they want to, what do they want to know that's coming down the pipeline? What's working for the company? What's not working for the company? What's interesting, need to knows or want to knows? And again, this is something that you can ask them on your survey to make sure that you're actually hitting the bullseye in terms of giving them the information that they need and that you're actually delivering on it. I would say don't willy-nilly this. It's important to have an internal communication strategy and plan. Even if you're an operation that has five people or 50 people or 100 people, there's no harm in documenting what is important to communicate, how you want to communicate, what information you want to communicate. And it's important to think about who's going to devise the content and deliver the communication. It's very important to communicate the survey results if you do decide to do employment engagement surveys, but do not survey if you do not plan to publish the good, the bad, and the ugly. Obviously, any confidential information shouldn't be shared, um, but otherwise, you're going to want to make sure you're going to communicate what you intend to do with the information from the survey and what the next steps will be. I recommend highlighting the top three and the bottom three that were, you're going to start to make changes on and communicate even if you don't know yet. You can say, we heard you. Thank you for your feedback. We appreciate you telling us and we understand and we identify there's some issues and concerns that need to be dealt with, but we just don't know how to deal with them yet. Stay tuned. At least they go, oh my goodness, they asked me what I wanted, what they, what I thought, and I told them, and now they're going to make reactions to it. So by following through and communicating, this is where you start to build trust with your employees and safe space, and you start to get that buy-in, and they want to come and show up and go above and beyond for you. Transparency, honesty, and humility are key to communication, and this is where you get the buy-in and the trust from the employees. Another component of communication that I think is really important is one-on-ones uh, with your staff, especially when there's issues. If you have an issue with a staff member, drop everything, go and talk to your employee in person, on the phone, or virtually. I think that is super important. 
And it's been shown that effective communication increases productivity by as much as 25%. And we all know it obviously increases retention and trust. So at Park Insurance, part of our internal communication plan includes a quarterly newsletter that we do. It's called the Park Pulse. I have a great time putting it together every single quarter. It includes a write-up from myself. Uh, it's called the Culture Corner with near C, uh, CEO, Natasha, which is fun. Uh, I always have our COO, Chelsea Fitzpatrick, do a write-up. And we usually have our CEO, Brian Fitzpatrick, put something in. We include important announcements, welcomings to our new staff, any upcoming events, um, and, uh, so, and some password events that we've done so we can reflect on what was done. Uh, we also do a uh, monthly bulletin, and it's based off our monthly leadership meeting, and it divulges some information about our numbers and our KPIs and just anything that's coming down the pipeline really quick and short literally written in bullet points. Uh, I love that bulletin. It's really valuable for our staff. And on a quarterly basis, I have one-on-ones with all of our staff. A lot of our managers do as well, and our supervisors with their staff. High communication happening over here, but these one-on-ones are no agenda, just 15 minutes, just to check in to see how you're doing. Those are virtually or in person. Um, and like I mentioned, make sure you build in communication questions into your regular surveys. All right, on to number three, recognition and development. Okay, so uh, I love this quote by Mary Kay Ash, who's the founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics. I know that Mary Kay is a multi-level marketing company and there's some uh, controversy around it. Not everyone loves them, but this quote is so true. So she says, there are two things people want more than sex and money. And that's recognition and praise. Isn't that so true? Recognition really does equal retention. When we take the time to let people know that we value them, it inspires them con to continue doing even more, to stay with the company and to become culture ambassadors, which we talked about at the beginning of the webinar. People who feel appreciated will always do more than what is expected of them. And isn't that true, right? I mean, you can reflect back to even a time when you had recognition, right? And, and it really made you feel appreciated and it made you want to go above and beyond. Uh, it makes us feel safe, which frees up time for people to do their best work. Um, if you're struggling with ideas for recognition, I recommend the book, A Thousand and One Ways to Reward Employees by Bob Nelson. I have it here. I was just poking around in our park insurance library a few weeks ago and I found it. And it's an older book, but it is amazing. It's got tons of ideas about uh, low cost ideas and strategies for recognition, appreciation, praise, and contests and awards. So I would, I would recommend picking that up because a lot of this stuff does need to cost you a ton of money to be really effective and have a lot of value. So what could recognition from a manager look like? This could be formally planned or spontaneous. You need to make sure you're matching the reward to the person and to the task. Recognition from a manager reinforces behavior and rewards results. And it can be as small as leaving a post-it note on their desk saying, hey, Susie, job well done. You super crushed it on your sales numbers last month. Or I saw you talking to that customer for 45 minutes and it was a struggling conversation, but you slayed it. Good work. Or it could be something larger, like an award um, and a write-up in the company newsletter about um, how you would like to recognize this employee and what they did. Uh, I also recommend peer-to-peer -peer recognition programs. These are so vital and they can be really valuable. And in fact, they can be even more valuable than a manager to employee recognition. And that's because on a subconscious level, we kind of expect recognition from our managers. And so when it happens, it's so well received and warmed and welcomed, but it's also sort of sitting back there like, yeah, he's supposed to, she's supposed to do that, right? But when it comes from a peer, that's something unexpected and so subconsciously it really makes it a lot more valuable. 
You can create programs or better yet, ask the employees to create one uh, based on peer-to-peer -peer recognition. So for example, at Park Insurance, we do what's called wow cards. And so that monthly bulletin that I send out to everyone, it always is attached with a blank wow card. And this is for our colleagues to fill out when they see another colleague exhibiting or living one of our values, which is passion, happiness, innovation, or teamwork. And so they include the employee, their colleague's name and their name, and a little write-up about why they're giving them this wow card. They send it back to me, and then we publish them every quarter in our Park Pulse newsletter. And what we've done, which is really fun for the past couple of years, is we've turned the wow cards into the wow award. So every year at our annual winter party, which happens in February, February, uh, the person, the employee who had the most wow cards throughout the year gets awarded with a wow award. And it literally is a big bronze medallion, like like Olympic medal that they get to hang around their neck that says wow award and has our logo on. It's super fun. So again, just throw up in the chat box, just think about what was some of the best recognition or rewards you have ever received or something that you do at your company that's really effective and works really well. I love sharing ideas. Um, and again, there's no shortage of them because you can write a whole entire book on it. Uh, development. Development equals productivity. So who likes performance reviews? I can't see any of you. I'm expecting no one's put up their hand because no one likes them. No one likes to give them. No one likes to be a part of them. They're really an uncomfortable situation where you pull an employee into your office and you give them some sort of Oreo effect performance review. You did great on this. You need to improve here, but you did great here. So I think that it is incredibly important for you to create valuable performance and development plans that are constructive, collaborative, and fun. I mean, if that's your, if that's part of your value, part of, I mean, that we're all about fun here at Park Insurance. So we try and build fun into lots of stuff, right? Uh, have employees set goals around their development, right? This is where it's the collaboration part of it, right? And unfortunately, we can't always be holding their hands and telling them where they need to grow and develop, right? Let them take some ownership of that, right? That's a large part of empowerment, right? And help mentor them and coach them to get there. And don't just do it annually, like annual performance reviews, like a lot of things happen in the other 364 days other than the performance one annual performance review. So make sure you're meeting with people uh, more often. Uh, let's see what else I had on here. Uh, right, so um, consider having educational reimbursement programs. This can go a long way for employee development. And consider providing development training or skills workshops for the staff on a regular basis. And these can be either professional or personal. Again, circling back to what we talked about before about taking care of your employees on both a professional and personal level, this is really how you can do that and make sure their life's intertwined are great and they can show up being the best versions of themselves. Some of the workshops we have done at Park Insurance have been uh, customer service, time management, effective communication, sales training. And on the personal side, we've done some really awesome ones uh, around um, med mindful meditation, heart math, uh, EFT tapping. So all these were about like how to like reduce stress. We did um, putting um, humor into the workplace for less stress. And uh, that was really exciting and fun. We've had a dietitian, and we also do a lot of them around social issues. We've done anti-racism and some other DEI workshops. Um, and again, uh, this is just sort of an overview. I'm flying through it quickly. Uh, I'm parched. I feel like I'm talking extremely fast, but I want to make sure you guys get as much as possible. Um, but more information is going to be included, all of this in my boot camp. So ingredient number four, human resources. Okay, I know, I know I said that HR is different than culture and it is, but there are some HR human resources best practices that I believe have an impact on creating an amazing workplace culture. And so I wanted to share those with you so that they don't um, get missed. So one is job posting. So think about what to include in the job posting. It should obviously include job responsibilities, but should also include information about your values and your purpose, your goals, your objectives. What are employees looking for? 
uh, and you know you could you know what this is now. If you if you did step one, if you did the first ingredient, you would know from asking what they want in their employment, what the majority of your staff wants, right? And you can put that in your job posting and where that aligns, and you can speak to it. Uh, include what your culture looks like and what a right fit looks like. And, uh, you know, just remember that the job market is hot right now. You really need to be selling yourself. Recruiting. Uh, recruiting and interviews should be based on your values. As I mentioned, at Park here, we are fun and we are energetic. And so I strive to make sure that all of our interviews, the first ones, are super fun, enjoyable and memorable for everyone. Uh, I start by asking, obviously, some skills questions. I want to make sure that they can actually technically do the job well um, and they're a licensed broker and that they're going to be able to provide some certain assets for us. But then a lot of the questions revolve around uh, fit for our company. And I like to make sure I have some really fun and unique and engaging questions. Um, and one question I always ask prospects that is a hit with everyone is I always ask them, if you could be any animal which would you be and why? Uh, and just for the record, because I know everyone's dying to know, I would be a dolphin. Uh, so throw up in the chat box again some of the exciting uh, interview questions that you've had in interviews or ones that you that you do when you're doing your recruiting. Hiring for fit, uh, but please make sure you're avoiding the like me bias. And so that's hiring people who are carbon copies of yourself. If you hire people who are exactly like you, you're not going to have any diversity, no creativity, and no innovation. But you do want to make sure that this person you're hiring, that your values and their values are in alignment, that they do like company culture, and that they like working in amazing workplaces. They are uh, they really value employee engagement, right? Do they want to be a culture ambassador? And could you envision you and your team enjoying a meal or a beer with this person at the end of the day? Onboarding. Super important. Uh, you've heard the phrase, obviously, the expression first impressions count. So here's your first impression, guys. You've hired them. My uncle was a very successful entrepreneur, and he always used to tell me staff will remember their first two weeks of employment and their last two weeks of employment. Everything else is in the middle is, is kind of gray, right? So start early on with the onboarding before they even start, right? Most of the time you have two or three weeks before they start. Take that time to start the onboarding process. Uh, starting a new job is incredibly stressful. It can be really scary. So maybe you're providing them with all the information that you think they need to know before they start to make them feel comfortable. So uh, one, make sure you any if they've got any documents to sign, send them off to them to sign before. No one likes showing up for their first day and spending two hours signing documents and pulling out their SIN card and finding their bank their bank check for the uh, direct deposit. Um, and you can send them a lot of information that will really decrease their stress and set them up for success on their first day and their first week, right? So, you know, tell them where to park or how to take transit, uh, what the dress code is what the kitchen situation is like. Like, do you have a microwave? Do you offer free coffee and creamer? Um, do you have non-dairy creamer? I don't know if that's important in your office. What are the bathrooms like? What are some of your favorite restaurants around in the area? Maybe pick up the phone and call them before they start. Ask them if they have any questions and uh, maybe have your CEO send them a welcome letter. That would be something really fun and creative. Make sure you involve the top leaders for sure. And offboarding. So whether voluntary or involuntary, it is always difficult when someone leaves. Um, but you can use this as an opportunity to learn and grow and try and change, turn it into a positive experience. So I would suggest conducting regular exit interviews, making sure you're capturing the information from that interview and cascading it down to whoever the information is relevant to. All right. So we're uh, getting there, the last ingredient, the fun stuff. So fun at work has been linked to enhanced motivation, increased productivity, it reduces stress, higher job satisfaction, improved task performance. Plus, who doesn't like having fun at work? I think this is really great for employers and employees both to have fun at work. So here's some recommendations. I think we got about uh, four minutes left. So I'm going to motor through a lot of these. Okay, so 
uh, make sure you're doing at least one event every year to say thank you to your team. Like you would like outwardly need to make sure you say thank you to everyone. Uh, at Perk Insurance, we're blessed enough to be able to do two. We do an annual summer party and an annual winter party. Um, and I just, you know, it's an one of the most amazing parts of my job is being able to be so creative and think outside the box and provide our staff with something that um, they're really going to get a lot of value out of and make them feel so appreciated. So we've done murder mystery dinners. Uh, we've had lots of outdoor company picnics and barbecues for our annual summer parties with giant Jenga and uh, <laughs> and giant Connect Four and just lots of fun games and prizes. Uh, we've rented restaurants before to do dinner and dancing, which is obviously you know something of the norm. But during the pandemic, when everyone was saying you know no, you know we're just going to hold off on doing our annual Christmas party because it's just too hard to do. That's when you need to like double down on your creativity and do it. So while we were in the pandemic, we held uh, our annual winter party virtually. We all went to Mexico virtually. Uh, we had a fiesta. Everyone got a, a box dropped on their door and uh, we had some bros and we had a mixologist teach us how to make margaritas and chefs teach us how to make guacamole and pico de gallo. And we had a DJ and we did a salsa dancing contest and it was absolutely amazing. Uh, and next week we get to be in person again, which is amazing. And we're doing the Hastings race course. I also am a huge fan of quarterly initiatives. They're a great way to add fun to your work. And it's something that if you have something on a quarterly basis, you always know something's running that's for fun. Um, I love to build these around health and wellness or building them around your values. And so at Perk Insurance, one of the things we've done before is we've done a plank challenge. So every day at 11 o'clock, we meet in the open area of our office and we literally get down like on our forearms and our toes and we do a plank. And we started at 10 seconds and we eventually increased 10 seconds every week until the end of 12 weeks where we uh, were planking for two minutes. And it was super exciting and it was just great. And then we celebrated with a pizza party because, you know, balance, the 80-20 rule, right? Uh, but some other ideas that we've done, if we've done a step challenge, which is really exciting, uh, and a gratitude challenge, just to name a few. Holiday observances and special days are another great way to celebrate and have fun. Obviously, there's all the traditional holidays that you can go for, Christmas, Thanksgiving, et cetera, et cetera. But there are a ton of unique celebrations. Um, that you can find online. There's literally a national something day for everything. So how about celebrating National Wear Your Pajamas to Work Day, which is in April, and we always do that. And it's super fun. Everyone gets to wear their pajamas to work. And you can build a little contest or prizes around it, which is fun. National Donut Day, where you would show up and bring donuts for everyone. Or how about National Swap Ideas Day, where you maybe you sit down and you have some some form of really fun brainstorming. National Trivia Day, where you could host a lunch and do trivia at, at lunchtime. Just be creative in your observations and go one step further even. So, you know, for example, at Park Insurance here at Halloween, we obviously allow our all our employees to dress up, but we go one step further. We're also doing a pumpkin carving contest, which is fun. Perks and benefits, so think Google and their beer Fridays and ping pong tables and lunchrooms, but that's not always just about perks and benefits. Think about, you know, extended health and dental benefits for staff and days off for your birthday or personal days or things that are just uh, for fun, like paint uh, and sip nights or random raffles. If you got a pair of tickets to something that you can't attend or don't want to, or you just bought them, you know, movie tickets on Saturday and raffle them off uh, or lunch roulette. Uh, anniversaries and birthdays, another great reason to celebrate. I would suggest giving your managers autonomy over a discretionary budget for this. Um, and it can be little things that Park Insurance, I send a anniversary card to every one of our staff members. It's handwritten and I include a little scratchman and I send it to their house because no one gets, um, no one gets mail anymore <laughs> unless it's bills. And even then we mostly, mostly get them electronically. Alrighty, Elaine, I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, just a few more things. So team building, uh, these are valuable and make sure they're fun. And so the key really is to be creative, think outside the box, make sure it's fun and memorable. And having fun at work is going to create memories 
that will last with your employees. And here's the really amazing part of it is that that's going to trickle down. So Bob is going to start and Susie is going to be like, Hey, Bob, guess what? Like, if like, or you should stick around this place. It's amazing to work at our annual staff party. We did this last year. We went to Mexico or we had this murder mystery party or we had a barbecue and they're going to tell the people and the, the people get excited about that and they want to continue to work there. So it's a really great retention tool. Um, again, to open the chat, what are some fun things your workplace has done, um, you know, big or small that were really successful that were memorable to you? All right, I'm going to end on my favorite quote by Maya Angelou. She said, people will forget what you said, and people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Um, so thank you, everyone, for your time today. Uh, it's been a pleasure presenting for you today. And again, this is all just very surface level. My boot camp is going to go into more great detail. Uh, on each of the ingredients with lots of examples, tools, and resources that you can do to start implementing your business. Please connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, follow Park Insurance and on all of our social uh, and our website so you can see more about our culture initiatives and some of the fun stuff that we're doing. Uh, and if you need any insurance, we have 35 lovely people here who would love to help you with your auto or your personal or your commercial lines insurance. Um, so I'll put that in contact information up and hopefully we see some of you in the boot camp. There's just a few seats left, so don't hesitate to register. And I think we're going to do some Q&As now. Thanks, Natasha. It's, uh, really amazing tips um, and information, a lot of information here. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the chat box. I see Jenny put a link to Perk app. Oh, so that's from um, some ideas for employees' incredible gifts and rewards. Thank you for that. Awesome. I don't know if I can message everyone, Ailet. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, you should be able to. I just uh, try now. Oh, everyone. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, I can't see the, I can't see the chat box. So tell me, was there anything interesting or has anyone got any questions for me? Yeah, so I just get uh, this link from Jenny. I don't know if there's anyone that wants to ask questions. Now is the time. Uh, I just wanted to ask Natasha. Um, yeah. We heard a lot. I mean, there's a lot of information. <laughs> I, there's a lot of information. <laughs> So many options of, you know, developing the culture in your uh, workplace. And obviously there's always room to do more, even if you started. But what if you haven't started? What if you are a small business that, um, you know, just wanted to do more, wanted to start somewhere? What's, what's yeah. going to be the first step? Yeah, I mean, I think even if you have more than a few employees, you could definitely start with those employment and with those employee engagement surveys. Um, keep them anonymous so people feel comfortable sharing their views um, and telling you their their honest, transparent feedback. Um, or you could even simply ask them, right? I mean, what's the harm in, you know, taking an hour away from your business and bringing everyone into the boardroom, even if you only have five people or, you know, I used to own a quick service restaurant. It was young people who were only 18, 19 years old, you know, only had six, seven people, right? And so, you know, I would bring them all into the back room, right? And say, you know, I really want to empower you guys. I really want to do this, right? Or, you know, I really want to build our workplace culture, right? It was many moons ago and we didn't call it workplace culture back then, right? The environment here, right? Um, what do you guys want, right? Like, what, what are you passionate about, right? Um, and so I would, you know, so I'd really start by either the engagement surveys or just having honest conversations with your staff and being transparent with them that you want to do better, you want to create more, and what do they need from you in order to do that? Great, thank you. And uh, there's a question here. Um, how can you create strong culture 
if you have multiple work locations? Yeah, it's hard to do. I mean, our our COO can attest to this. When we got deployed to all work from home uh, during the pandemic, I panicked. I was like, what is my rule? Like, my rule is us all being together. And we do. We have three locations here at Park Insurance. And so some of my tips for creating a strong culture is making sure that the communication is tight, right? So that ingredient that we talked about, making sure everyone knows, right? So if you're communicating to everyone the same messaging, it's being delivered at the same time and everyone's in the know. Uh, the one silver lining around the pandemic is, is that we now have these opportunities to connect virtually. Um, so we're starting uh, in a couple weeks a squat challenge. So like the plan calendar. And so we're starting at five squats a day and working our way up to 100 squats a day. Well, bless us. I'm not <laughs> sure how we're going to do but we're going to do it for pizza is what we're going to do. But we're doing it two o'clock every day. And you know what? People can do it um, with us virtually. And sometimes we have retail staff, right? Because they work selling auto plan, ICBC insurance uh, for our clients. And so we go by the honor system. And if they can't join us to do their 15 planks on day three, you know, I just ask that they do it on their own time in the back room. And then we all get to kind of come together. It's just like that team bonding, right? Doing things together. And I would also recommend making sure that that again, you're doing something on a regular basis to say thank you to the staff where you're all coming together, whether that be a town hall meeting and doing some team building activities, or you're doing a thank you appreciation for them, or you're inviting everyone to come out to bowling on Friday night, or you're doing a paint and sip night, something of that nature. Yeah, great. I think that's all our time for today. So thank you very much, Natasha. Thank for you. Your time. Thank you. Thank you.